God bless you, Dawes Road family, and the Lord bless you, those of you who've tuned in online. May the Lord bless us as we look into His Word today. We're in our continued study in the book of the Revelation, the last book of our Bibles. If you have it, uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. Whether you have a hard copy or a virtual copy, let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. God's two inside agents. God's two inside agents. And with that, we want to be encouraged that God is in control and all glory and honor and praise belongs to God. And we want to, tr tr we want to receive great encouragement through this uh, today. So in our Bibles, Revelation chapter 11, we'll talk a little bit about uh, just the whole idea of God's inside agents, and then we'll crack into Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 to 14. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are in charge. You see the beginning and the end, the end to the beginning, and you are orchestrating events according to your plan and your purpose right down throughout, it, throughout history. So, Father, we want to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. We want to put our trust in you, not what man says, but what you say. And, Father, I pray, encourage the hearts of your people and those who do not know Christ, that, Father, even today they would say yes to Jesus, for there is only one Savior. His name is Jesus, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose again from the dead, the one who is alive forevermore. So in the name of Jesus, by your Spirit, empower us as we speak and as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 11, a very dynamic, powerful chapter and uh, we're going to see some amazing details. Now, let me just talk to you a little bit about the whole idea that God has inside agents. Because we're going to talk about two of God's inside agents here in this amazing chapter. For instance, um, Jesus is beginning his, his earthly ministry of preaching and teaching. He has grown up as a, as a carpenter. He now leaves that aside. He has been baptized and begins his preaching ministry. He goes to his hometown Nazareth. And of course, his hometown is, is wanting him to uh, put on a show and uh, display miracles and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Jesus refuses to do that because he's not here for a show. He has a purpose for our salvation. And uh, so one of the examples he uses is that back in the Old Testament, uh, Elisha healed a man of leprosy. But that man was not from the people of Israel. It was actually a Syrian commander who was actually the enemy of the people of Israel. God chooses. God displays His mercy and grace to whom He chooses. And God doesn't play favorites. There isn't the hometown advantage as it were. Of course, the crowd is very, very upset. But now when you look into that story of, the, of this Syrian commander, his name is Naaman, is healed of leprosy. There's an inside agent involved in that story. See, God was using Naaman to have victory because his own people were uh, involved in, in idolatry and perhaps even witchcraft. And so he used the Syrian army to, as it were, discipline, spank the people of Israel. And so he had given uh, Naaman great victories, but he also had given Naaman um, leprosy. Well, in some of the raids, his army had captured um, a little girl and she became the slave girl of Naaman's family. Amazingly enough, this little slave girl gives testimony and praise to God, even though she's a slave girl, and said that there is someone in Israel that could heal her master of his leprosy. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? And because of that testimony of that little girl, Naaman eventually, as the story progresses, finds his way into Israel, meets the prophet, actually doesn't meet the prophet Elisha, but receives instructions from Elisha how he can be healed of his leprosy. And God brings a great victory. God brings a great healing. Praise God. God has his inside agent, just a little girl in a household. Um, years later, there would be the... Um, the Persian Empire would take over the world, and Israel was caught in all of that as well. Um, the, one of the uh, men in the Persian Empire, an Amalekite actually, by the name of Haman, 
became a favorite of the king, King Xerxes, the Hebrew Ahasuerus, but we know him as King Xerxes, and he became a favorite, and the king gave him a favor, and what he wanted to do, what Haman wanted to do was to kill all the Jews, kill all the Jews, and he would have got away with it except that, well, God has his, what, inside agent, isn't that right? Um, he had set up a queen who had won an international beauty contest. He considered her the most beautiful woman in the entire world. He made her her queen. She just happened to be Jewish. And you know the story on how Haman went down, <laughs> but the people of Israel were saved. But there was an inside agent. God has his inside agents. Amazingly, uh, there's the story of a Ahithophel, um, one of the smartest, wisest guy in the country of Israel. But he was on a ter- He was angry. He was angry. His, he was... Um, because of his, the wisdom that God gave him and the intelligence that God gave him, he was considered the counselor to the king. His son was one of the mighty warriors, good friends with the king. And actually, his, um, his granddaughter uh, married a warrior who, who had embraced or actually had grown up with believing in idols, but that warrior had rejected all the idols and turned to the living God. And so Hithophel had put his stamp of blessing on their union, on their marriage. And he was thrilled. And this, this young warrior who had married his granddaughter became again one of the best friends of David because he had put his trust in God and stood side by side so often with David to fight the battles, praise God. But on one occasion, the, 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 the king uh, got a little lazy, didn't go out to lead the, the battle. He just sent out one of his generals to do it instead. He stays home and he sees a beautiful woman taking a bath, and he says, I want her, sends orders to bring her up. Who is she? Who is she? Oh, she's actually the wife of one of your best friends. She's actually also the daughter of one of your best friends. She's also, um, and this is made clear a little bit later on, she's actually the granddaughter of your number one counselor, your number one advisor. Oh, I still want her. I still want her. And so here this young woman is has been commanded by the king for an appearance, and she is violated, and she becomes pregnant. And to make things even worse is the king decides that he wants to cover up the pregnancy by having her husband killed in battle. And, and, and Ahithophel, he knows all of this, and he becomes angry. He becomes very angry. If we put all the, the details together, we see the, the, the seething anger, how his, his son, grandson-in-law is now killed, and how his granddaughter's life has been turned upside down. How, how could he do such a, how could the king do such a horrible thing? I want my vengeance. I want my vengeance. But you see, Hithophel, being a very wise and intelligent man, knew that, that wisdom means being patient. And so even though he knew that God had forgiven King David of his sin, that's an amazing story in itself. He also knew that God had said that David would experience trouble in the family. And Ahithophel waited for his time. When there's trouble in the family, then I'll pounce. Then I'll, then I'll, I'll take advantage of that situation and we'll see the king go down. He was angry, angry. Sure enough, years later, one of the king's own son decided to lead a rebellion and actually wanted to take over the kingdom from his dad, which would mean that he was actually trying to kill his dad when his dad realized that the tables had turned, his dad uh, ran, ran for his life with his entourage and with his, his best friends and his warrior group and so on. They're leaving, they're leaving, they're leaving. And so Absalom, the, the, the son of King David now, brings counsel together to see what they should do to try to finish off, seal this victory. And Ahithophel gives his very wise, very, very wise uh, counsel. He says, don't wait a moment. Go now, chase down the king. They are, they are in distress. Chase him down, kill him. Don't kill anyone else. Just kill the king. Kill the king. You can almost see the, if you just read between the lines, you can see the, the rage spitting out of, his, out of his mouth. You can see the, his eyes ablaze. Just kill the king. Don't kill anyone else. 
if you kill the king, the whole nation will come to you. Don't kill anyone else. Just kill the king. He was so angry that this king had violated his granddaughter. So angry that his, his son-in-law, his, his, son-in-law, his grandson-in-law had been killed by this king and he wanted his vengeance. But very interestingly, also in that council was another fellow by the name of Hushai. He was the confidant of the king, uh, King David, and uh, considered like the, the friend of David. When, 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 when the king needed someone just to, to vent with, you, you know, some of us, do, do you ever need to vent? Sort of just get off your chest? And you want someone that's, you know, you can, you can do this in confidence, who won't start telling stories. Well, this is what the king said. No, 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 no. Just someone that can, can sort of just bring, you know, just allow you to sort of let it all out and, and just sort of, um, you know, get rid of some of the frustrations and just sort of get your heart clear again and, and just to kind of help you move on. Kind of the friend, the confidant of the king. His name was Hushai. And in that council, after they'd heard Ahithophel, speak of, just kill the king, kill the king. They thought, well, that's what we need to do. I mean, Hithophel is never, ever wrong, so let's go for it. But let's just check with Hushai first. And Hushai says, well, no, the council isn't good this time. Usually he's right on, but not this time. Uh, they're going to be like wounded bears. You know how great a warrior is. And if, 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 if all of a sudden th- th- there's a bit of a slaughter somewhere, I mean, the, all of Israel is going to be absolutely terrified because they know that David and his men are the greatest warriors in the entire nation, and we're going to lose badly. So let's just, let, let's just pause for a moment. Let's get you know, all the warriors together from the entire country, and we'll chase David down. And that's the counsel that Hushai gave. Well, they said, well, that's actually, that sounds like good because I think they were personally afraid of, of David and his warriors. They knew how dangerous, powerful David physically and in terms of war was. And so they said, okay, that's what we'll do. And Hithophel immediately knew that they had lost. They had not seized the advantage and the moment. And he immediately resigned, immediately went home, put his house in order, and then fell, as it were, on his sword. Uh, but you see, there was an inside agent, Hushai, the confidant of David, an inside agent. It's amazing how God has his inside agents to fulfill his plan, his purposes, and declare and to declare his glory. That's the kind of situation we have here in Revelation chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to, the, to, to Revelation chapter 11. Let me give you a little bit of the context here, and, and then let's walk through the first part of this chapter. We'll go through verse 1 down to verse 14. Amazing, dramatic story. Let me tell you what's happening so far. So far, the church is not here. The church is not here for chapter 11. The church has been what we call raptured or snatched up. Uh, The angel has blown his trumpet, as it were, and the dead in Christ shall rise first and receive their resurrection bodies. And those who are still alive and there for the coming of the Lord, they shall be instantly transformed to receive their resurrection bodies. And so we will be with the Lord forever. We're with the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. So that now God can bring his righteous judgments upon a wicked, rebellious world to clear the path so that righteousness and peace can reign and we can enjoy the glory of the, uh, uh, of the kingdom. And, and, and so, so God is pouring down His judgments. Now, they're, they're horrific judgments. I mean, we've already seen some of the things that will take place un- until then. I mean, there's things like wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and economic difficulties and, of course, false religions, false teachers, false antichrists, and so on. Um, All of that is taking place. Persecution, difficulties, um, and and, and so on. All that's taking place. But now now with the church snatched up and and, 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 uh, and, um, raptured into the presence of Jesus, now God can bring, can, God does bring His judgment on the planet, a planet that is absolutely rebellious. And so we've seen plague after plague after plague upon the planet. Now, I don't know if they're sequential. Like when God did the plagues on the land of Egypt way back in the book of Exodus, the, you know, way back in the beginning of the Old Testament, 
um, very interesting. There'd be one plague and it would be completed. And then God would move to the second plague. I don't know if that's the way it's going to be with these, these final plagues or if um, it, it will be a cumulative effect. One will sort of right on top of the other. Either way, it'll be absolutely devastating because the lingering effects of each of these plagues will affect the planet, the globe, and in a, in a horrible way. I, I, mean, I, I mean, the first plague is a, a plague upon the land, and the land becomes toxic and sores and disease and all of that kind of thing. That's the first plague. And then the second plague is on the oceans, and a third of the life of the, the oceans is destroyed. You can imagine the, the economic and, and ecological um, disaster that that would be. A third of the ocean uh, completely devastated. And then the third plague, uh, a plague on the fresh waters, the fresh water supplies. And many people are, are because they're contaminated, they're, they're, they're dying of its poisonous effects and so on. And then there's a fourth plague and the atmosphere becomes toxic and, and, and people are being burned. I, I don't know if the ozone layer is being, uh, being uh, uh, set aside or whatever, but it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's horrible. Land and ocean and fresh water and atmosphere. And then on top of it, there is a five months of demons being released from the bottomless pit. And the NIV has translated that word, the abyss which is mean very deeply down there. Uh, hell, hell, these demons are coming out of hell, out of the bottomless pit, out of the abyss, and they're not allowed to kill. They're only allowed to torture for five months, and the pain is excruciating, and people want to die, but God doesn't give them release. And so here they're suffering horribly for five months, and then afterwards, God brings down the next plague, and there's a 200 million man army sweeping through the earth. And the Bible says it'll kill a third of the population. We've got millions, if not billions, of bodies being absolutely killed and destroyed and just flung everywhere with this 200 million man army sweeping through. Horrible, horrible, horrible. You would think at this particular point, the people will say, okay, God, enough, enough. When we got to the end of Revelation chapter 9, you would think that people would say, enough, God, help us. But no, there is no repentance. They chew, they harden their hearts even more. And they refuse to turn to God. They refuse to accept Jesus as their Savior. Well, I can just imagine some of the, 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 the world leaders trying to speak to their people, to try to make it sound like that it's, you know, this is not God. This is not God. We're going to be introduced to the Antichrist, the beast that comes out of the abyss. He's going to have the power and energy and direction from hell itself. You can imagine the kind of man that he is. It's called the beast that comes out of the abyss, out of hell itself, as it were. A man, and yet totally energized by Satan, energized by hell, and so on. And you can imagine they're, get, they're getting their heads together and trying to see if they can find some way of explaining all these judgments of God. I mean, it's so clearly that God is bringing His judgment on the planet, and yet they do not want to acknowledge God. I could just imagine some of the stories they're telling, right? right? Uh, oh, this is just an extreme form of global warming. Or it's some kind of cataclysmic, cosmic accident that's taken place. And that's why we're experiencing all of these things. But God's glory is going to be seen. Because God will have His inside agents making sure that the world, the planet, the globe knows that this is God's hand. This is God's judgment. And that there is only one Savior, only one rescue. And that is God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now with that kind of intro, let's get into Revelation chapter 11. Let me just take you through these first 14 verses. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Revelation is the last book of your Bible, so it should be easy for us to find. Let me take you through these first 14 verses. I was given a read like a measuring rod. So I was given a tape measure, okay? And was told, go and measure the temple of God in the altar 
with its worshipers. In other words, these are the people that are secure in the presence, as it were, of God. But verse 2, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. In other words, the people who are in the presence of God, they're safe and secure from these judgments. But even, as it were, the city where Jesus did most of his ministry, and the nation where Jesus did most of his ministry, will experience incredible uh, plagues and difficulties. Yes, yes. And, and, and it'll take place for some 42 months. They will trample on the holy city. The Gentiles will trample on the holy city. And they'll have no respect for the, um, uh, the fact that this would be, as it were, God's city. They'll trample on it for 42 months. But look at it, verse 3. Look at this. The inside agents. And I will appoint my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Now, it's interesting, 1,260 days equals 42 months. 42 months equals three and a half years. So we've got a fairly lengthy period of time of these two inside agents who are going to be preaching concerning the glory of God. They will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. There will be, there will be a sense of mourning. There is not a delight that God is bringing His judgment is because these people have refused. So this is not. So these prophets are ma making it clear. These two inside agents of God are making it clear, absolutely clear, that what's happening on the planet is not global warming. It is not just a accidental, accidental, uh, you know, a joining together of a whole bunch of events, uh, natural events, and is just causing some trouble all over the planet. It's not some cosmic, you know, cataclysmic cosmic accident that's taking place, and that's why all these troubles are taking place in the planet. No, this is God's judgment, and you need to repent. You need to turn to God, and for some three and a half years, they are preaching. Now, look at verse 4. This is actually a, a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. They are, listen to this, the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of all the earth. Now, that's a reference way back to Zechariah, the second last book of the Old Testament, chapter 4, where Zechariah the prophet sees this amazing vision of a lampstand that has a bowl on top. It's fed by these two olive trees so that it will continue to be bright and light. And God's glory is going to be seen. And these two trees, and, 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 and the prophets even asked, Zechariah's asked, so, so who are these? What are these? I don't know. I don't know. And it's right in the middle of that that we get that incredible promise, that, that, that incredible declaration from God. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, that so many of us have memorized, so many of us have been encouraged by. Listen to this. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the, um, the, the governor of the nation of Israel as they were returning from captivity, going back to the promised land there before the time of Jesus. So this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, the governor. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In, in, in other words, anything that is truly accomplished or achieved is because it's been God's power. Have you been encouraged in the faith? It's because of God's power. Have you been, have you stood strong? It's because of God's power. Have you experienced the loving touch of God? Maybe through some of God's people? That's God's spirit, God's power. Praise God. It is God. He is the source of all encouragement, of all power. Praise His name. Uh, so when we take this now back to uh, Revelation chapter 11, we discover that this is actually... Uh, uh, an indication to us that these two inside agents of God are filled with the Spirit to accomplish the purpose and plan of God, to declare His glory. And there's a message of repentance. You could just imagine how some of the 
world leaders, the Antichrist, and so on, are going to take this message. They will not be happy. They will try to send assassins. But listen to this, listen to this. Verse 5, verse 5 of Revelation chapter 11. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. I mean, they are invincible, these inside agents of God. The, 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 the Antichrist and the, and, the, and, the, and the leaders of the planet try to send even an assassins, but every time they try to kill them or destroy them or get them out of the way, it's like as if fire comes out of their mouths and their enemies are obliterated. And, they, and these two inside agents of God continue to declare the purpose of God, the glory of God, the power of God, and that people need to repent. And there's only one way. It's through Jesus. What a powerful message and not only is it a powerful message, and they seem to be invincible, but they are actually able to perform incredible miracles. Listen to this, verse 6. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when I look through the Old Testament, I, I see there's actually two characters that, that sound like this. I mean, there was a fellow that actually prayed that it wouldn't rain. God told him to pray that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. And God answered his prayer. It didn't rain for three and a half years. His name is Elijah. At the end of those three and a half years, Elijah actually called down fire from heaven to show to the people of Israel that the Lord, he is God. And then he prayed that same day for rain. And it rained. They hadn't seen rain for three and a half years. You can imagine how parched. The land was, how desperate life was, death and destruction all around because people were dying of thirst, literally. And then finally it rains. Oh, that sounds like Elijah, doesn't it? And, and this turning the water into blood and all sorts of other plagues and miracles, doesn't that sound like Moses? So in one sense, here we have these two inside agents of God coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah and Moses, as it were. Uh, amazing. And so you can look back at your, some of your Old Testament stories and you can see some of the kind of miracles they did and you can just kind of sort of, uh, sort of overlay those miracles and so on on these two inside agents of God. You see, it's very clear now to the planet, very clear to the planet that what is happening here is not global warming. This is not some cataclysmic cosmic accident that is devastating their planet. It just happens to be a you know, just, we just got to get through this. No, no, no. This is the judgment of God. And our, response, our proper response should be to huh, repent and turn to God. Well, listen to this. Listen to this. Verse 7. Now, when they had finished their testimony, so they've been preaching out for three and a half years, and they've preached every message that they were sent to preach. Now, when they had finished their testimony... The beast, here it is, the Antichrist. We're finally introduced to the Antichrist, the beast. Uh, the beast that comes up from the abyss, the bottomless pit, hell. Okay, so he's energized, um, directed by Satan, hell. Wow, he's empowered by it, by Satan, by hell itself. The beast that comes from up from the abyss will attack them, the two inside agents of God, and overpower, and this time, kill them. I, I want you to take for a moment, just pause for a moment. I want you to get the reaction of the world leaders and the people across the planet as they realize that now the Antichrist has somehow been able to overpower and kill these two Agents of God. Incredible. I mean, these two agents of God, agents of God for the last three and a half years have been causing devastation. No one can challenge their message. Anyone who tries to assassinate them, they are burned immediately. They're bringing plagues down to show that this is from God and not just some ac uh, cosmic accident. And can't wait to get rid of them. Finally, they're, finally they're done. Now, now, this is what happens. The, verse 8, their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively, figuratively called Sodom, an ancient wicked sin, uh, city that God had to ultimately judge, and Egypt that had the people of Israel 
uh, in bondage, and they are known for their rebellion against God. But it says here at the end of verse 8, where also their Lord was crucified. So Sodom and Egypt are just kind of code words for Jerusalem. Where are these, where are these two agents of God been? What, where has been their center of their activity? Obviously, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, that's really the center of history. That's the, the epipoint. That's the uh, epicenter of world history. Um, it all flows around Jerusalem, around Israel, because that's God's plan to bring in through Israel uh, our Savior. And so history flows through there. And so here it is. Um, Jerusalem, their bodies are lying on Jerusalem, on the road, as it were. Verse 9, for three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So I don't know if they're shot or sliced or whatever, but there's their bodies just lying in the middle of the road. And you got these television cameras beaming in on these, these two inside agents of God. And we won! We won! That would be the cry, the chant. And as a matter of fact, they, they are starting to celebrate. It's like it's New Year's Eve. Verse 10, the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. Whoa. End of story. Oh, <laughs> no, not end of story. Oh, you see, they thought they had won. Finally, we get to steal their voices. Finally, we're not going to hear anything more about Jesus and God and God's judgment and repentance and all of that kind of thing. We don't need to listen to that anymore. Wrong. Wrong. Oh, I love this next verse or two. Listen to this, verse 11. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. Could you just imagine? After three and a half days of people just piling on garbage and celebrating that these two inside agents of God are gone, and, they're, and we can see and gaze on their bodies, and we can celebrate. All of a sudden, they stand up, and they're alive. And now the world is terrified. I mean, the camera... The TV cameras, um, the news, uh, news cameras, man, they're, 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 they're shocked. They're terrified. And terror struck those who saw them. Verse 12, then they heard a loud voice from the heavens saying to them, to the two inside agents of God, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on at that very hour. There was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified. Now, here it is. Here's the point. And gave glory to the God of heaven. Finally, finally, they will have to admit this is God's doing. It's not global warming. It's not some cataclysmic, cosmic accident. It's not just a, a bunch of... You know, things have just kind of happened and kind of all happened at the same time and some kind of massive natural tsunami has wiped us out. No, 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 no. This is finally an understanding that this is God's work. You can't stop God. Amen. Hallelujah. God's two inside agents declaring the glory of God. Verse 14 ends the paragraph. The second woe was past. The third woe is coming soon. Wow, wow. God is in charge. Honor, respect, the, the power and the honor of God. Now, for those of you who love the Lord, you're, perhaps some of us are thinking, well, we're not even going to be here for this, so why is it here? And, and what, what, what do I get out of this? Like, what, what kind of encouragement can I possibly get out of this? I, I, I just want to go back to, to that uh, amazing verse 11. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. I want you to know that the resurrection triumphs, trumps everything. Because of the resurrection, we win 
we win, folks. Maybe your life, maybe my life, seems like it has, it's hit the fan, and I mean, we're just, we're, we're so discouraged, and we feel like everyone's beating up on us, and maybe our lives are at risk. Some of the places in the, on the planet here today, people are, 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 are dying because they love Jesus. Horrible, horrible. And it's so easy to be discouraged and in despair and things aren't working right and all this kind of stuff. But I want you to know that ultimately, you're the winner. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you win. And I get such a great encouragement from this. These two inside agents of God are wiped out after three and a half years. But then on the third, three and a half days later, the Spirit of God, the breath of God enters them and they are raised to life again, and they're alive and brought up to the, God's glorious presence. Hallelujah, praise God. You see, the resurrection of Jesus means that we also will rise and we will live forever. And we can get sometimes so discouraged about what's happening in our lives right now, but keep looking forward. Keep looking up. Our day is coming. We will be raised to life again. Hallelujah. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Where, O death, is your victory? (laughs) Praise, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you put your trust in Christ? It's not too late. It's not too late. It's pretty clear. We are people who need forgiveness. We are people who need to be saved. We need to be rescued from our sin because if we're not rescued from our sin, we will experience eternal condemnation, damnation, and hell. My dear friends and family, family of God, put your trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead, and He is Lord. He is Savior. The two inside agents of God will make that clear to a world that is in absolute rebellion. But don't you be part of that world that is in absolute rebellion. No, repent. Turn to God. Receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. God bless you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.